Good evening. Welcome to our session on AI and healthcare in AI in the healthcare industry. My name is uh, Priya Nagaraj. I'm the professor of I'm a professor of economics and global business in the Katsakis College of Business, William Patterson University. Uh, I'm also an ambassador for women in data science, and in, it is in that role as well that I'm uh, welcoming you all to this session by our uh, lead female speaker, um, Pavani Mancharli. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to um, introduce our panel. I have with me here Peter Kayazo from the Global Business uh, Financial Institution, uh, who is a co-ambassador uh, for WIDS. We also have with us uh, Yeshua Perez, who's the president of the Student Club Data Analysis and Science Club at uh, the College of Business. And we have a student, Kaylee Gomez, who is a member of the club and will be helping me with the chat and taking the questions today. Uh, before we go on, I want to invite Yesh to say a few words about the club. Yesh, you're on mute. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just give me a second. Sorry. Um, so as you know, my name is Yeshua Perez, and I have the privilege of serving as the president of Data Analytics and Science Club, also known as DASC for short, here at William Patterson University. Um, our mission is uh, at DASC is simple, uh, to support and spread awareness in a dynamic world of data analytics while fostering a collaborative environment where our students can engage in meaningful projects and connect with professionals in the field. I, I invite each of you to join us in the exciting journey and the incredible opportunities that, that DASC offers. From hands-on projects to network, networking events, be sure to participate in the polls and during the time at the end of the session to sign up and become part of the vibrant community. Thank you, Yesh. Um... Our speaker today, Pavani, is the CEO of uh, Cognitive Health Technologies, an AI-driven healthcare technology company, which is revolutionizing patient experience and financial outcomes. She is committed to advancing women in leadership and leveraging technology for societal impact. Pavani's journey began in STEM programs during her youth, and as the lone female executive leader of a 1,500-plus employee team at IDS Infotech, she achieved a remarkable 300% growth she further honed her expertise at a 10 billion plus global technology company managing the healthcare vertical business. Transitioning to entrepreneurship, she has played a pivotal role in NYC-based tech startups, driving the development of groundbreaking digital healthcare products. In 2018, she founded her firm Cognitive Health, successfully integrating AI into healthcare. She's an accomplished engineer and an MBA holder and her global work spans multiple countries, including UK, Asia Pacific, and India. She currently resides in New Jersey, and we are very lucky to have her here today with us. So I pass uh, the stage on to Pavani. We are recording this session. So uh, those of us who have not been able to join us as yet will have this available in our repository in the future. So welcome, Pavani. Thanks, Priya, for the introduction. Good evening, everybody, and uh, hello to the wonderful panel here as well. Um, I'm going to sh start sharing my screen. If Am I already doing that? I don't think so. Not yet, but I... Yeah, give me one second. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so when Priya and Peter, uh, we had a conversation of sharing what's going on in the data and the AI world uh, in general and specifically in the healthcare, it was very interesting for me to uh, take up this opportunity to talk to the students uh, of, of your uh, college and campus who are interested in the data and AI sciences. Um, as you know, this is a vast, vast um, uh, industry and space, and it's been there for many, many years. This is not, a, it's, we have new names right now, but it's data and data sciences have been there around for a very long time. Um, and just a quick, you know, be, uh, uh, beyond what Priya just mentioned on my profile and what I have done, um, I was never a great math student growing up. Uh, if math used to be like, you know, let me get this, get this done with. 
Uh, but I had the uh, a great fortune to work in my work life. I had the great fortune to work with some amazing people where uh, data is data unless you make it an information and use it for some purposes. And that was the learning I had during my growing up years. And since then, my love for data and information is um, something um, which I share. And that's one of the core reasons why we started the company Cognitive Health, where we are leveraging data uh, uh, in the in the healthcare space to make an impact in how we are we are operating in the healthcare industry. As everybody knows, healthcare industry is one of the largest employers uh, in the U.S., if not the number one. Uh, and there is so much happening out there that um, it's 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 very imper imperative for us to kind of understand what's going on in that space and how we can make a difference there. Um, I'm sure in your college, everywhere else, you've heard this. One of the uh, uh, um, famous famous quotes, which this is my again my first very early experience and exposure to what's the uh, value of data. In God we trust. All others must bring data. Even if you are an atheist, uh, let's take away the God. But you know we can. We all need to bring data. We cannot just you know talk about the qualitative measures. Uh, along with that, we need the data to support what we are saying. Um, and having said that, some of the things data and AI is in our life, everyday life, whether we realize it or not, from going on the social media and figuring out, you know, what we are trying to purchase, uh, how are we planning, how are you planning to pay your loans back, or are you planning to budget your monthly finances, you know, your, your dating apps, uh, what what have you, everything and anything you are uh, experiencing in today's world is driven by data. You know, if you take an example of uh, how are you even buying your health insurance, there's so many actuaries sitting in the behind the firewalls of the companies, uh, putting, a, putting a risk and a value to your profile and giving you options of multiple options of what would be your premiums be. So the data is everywhere in our life, whether we uh, realize that or not. And being in the data in the healthcare industry, uh, very interesting for us to kind of look behind the curtains and see what's going on behind there and how data is being um, generated and you know how are we using that. So if you look at specifically, and I'm gonna focus a little bit on healthcare space. Again, healthcare, as I said, the reason why this is so important is um, this is one of the most debated topics, our elections and our politics uh, you know, swing and have a heavy impact on how everybody's point of view is on healthcare, the different uh, nuances and opinions we have around there. It's the number one, if not the one uh, employer in the country. This trillions of dollars uh, of expense expenditure we have here. We are still we are a developed country, but our healthcare doesn't measure up with some of the other developed countries in the world. So there's lots going on in the healthcare space. And some of the flavors of the data or, you know, what kinds of data we have in healthcare, if you just uh, take a look, you know, everybody has an experience of going to a doctor's office or a physician's office or a hospital for yourself or your loved one. So there's a lot of data going on there. They, they have your demographic information. They have your past hist medical history. They have your family history. They have your insurance information. All of that comes under your administrative data. Then you have your clinical data where you're looking at your health records. When you go to a physician's office, they are taking your information and keying in their systems, which is called the EHR. So they have all your information in there, whether when you go to a lab test, when the lab work is done, or you take an X-ray or an MRI. So there are all kinds of different data, which is the, the big large bucket is the clinical data. Then you have the research data, uh, which is all the information from the clinical trials, which is much more nuanced. You have surveys, you have biomarker information, uh, and the patients are reporting their outcomes and through these clinical um, uh, uh, trials, you have all of that layer of another research data. Uh, and the big, another big data which we have right now is also the population health data. So how is a whole set of communities doing? How is a group of people doing in, your, in, in, in the area? Environmental data. We just had COVID uh, and the whole data related to COVID, the, the number of vaccinations, the number of phases, the rounds, all of that, there's a lot of data happening there. So when you say data specifically for healthcare, the one of the flavors or the uh, very unique things of healthcare specifically is there are different kinds of data which you see on the screen on the right side, which is the data standards. Um, there are it's not just you know an Excel file or it's not just um, 
a, 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 ta a tabular form, form or an SQL. There are multiple layers within this. You know, you can look it up. Uh, you have you have medical codes. You have images. You have um, a SNOMED, you know, categories for the kind of diagnoses you can code. And the most uh, latest one is the fire, how are two systems talking to each other? So there are multiple ways these data are organized and structured, uh, which is why it's very important for us to understand uh, that for you to operate in the, uh, in, for the healthcare data. And who are the people who are, from where is this data being generated, right? Who are the different entities who are either using it or generating this data? So if you look at healthcare, very, very simplistically, there is a provider or a physician or a hospital who's providing care for the patient. On the other side, you have an insurance company with whom you buy your insurance product, health, health insurance product, what you have for you, your family members, everything else. These two are the biggest uh, uh, generators or contributors of data and the consumers of data, but the rest of the ones which here are equally important. Uh, you have pharma companies, you know, from whom we buy our, uh, our our medicines, our drugs, and everything else. There are manufacturers, there are distributors, there are pharmacy benefit managers. The whole layer of you know that that component of um, companies generate and use data. You have medical device companies where you have x-ray machines and you have injectables, implantables, uh, durable medical equipment like wheelchairs, all of that generate a lot of amount of data. And based on the demographic of the country, what we have, you have the aging population, you have you know multiple of those layers. So each of these layers of data manages or takes care uh, or, and generates that kind of data uh, uh, for, for, for us to work with. Then you have the research in academia, you have medical research, uh, academic medical centers, research centers, regulatory agencies like HIPAA, uh, government agencies, then health information technology companies are the companies which are working and helping with the providers and payers, IT companies, solution providers, consultants who work with these technologies and who work with these data to make it work and execute workflows and help them navigate this whole uh, layers. The most important person or the most important entity in this space is us, the patient or the member as the providers and the insurance companies call us. At the end of the day, this is our data and you own the data. And when you, you know, if you have a, if you have a child or for yourself, you need to uh, play a sport or go somewhere, you need to give all your information. So you, that's all your information and you are generating and uh, managing your own data. And at some point, if this is all, uh, you know, if, if you be here and talk about uh, I don't know if any of you are even like looking uh, at what's happening in healthcare. The one of the uh, big news for the last almost um, few weeks is one large uh, uh, health information technology company was hacked, uh, which has uh, uh, millions of millions of healthcare records. Uh, it kind of almost crippled the healthcare industry in terms of exchanging claims and data, uh, all of that, that there was a uh, um, talk of bringing an emergency COVID-like response uh, in, uh, to be implemented so that the small play providers can get some financial benefit because they're not able to submit their claims, et cetera. And the whole amount of patient data got exposed. Um, so we as individuals, we have a right to, and the responsibility to uh, kind of be mindful of where our information is and how much we are sharing and what to take care of that. So all of these entities are uh, generating and using large amounts of data. Uh, and now is the where the magic happens. What are we doing with all of this data? You know, besides just uh, looking at taking in the data, what are we doing in the data? One, there's a huge, huge, you know, all of these, every every company, every every player in this, ent every entity in the healthcare has to have managed their data. They need to have the security in place. They need to have um, basic requirements in place. There is government mandated rules and compliance you need to have in place so that you have enough guardrails and enough firewalls to protect your data. But once you have that, how is this data and AI is used in healthcare? Um, first and foremost, your patient care, your clinical care. Based on all the data you have, physicians are able to look at all of that data to create treatment plans, to personalize 
individual personalized medicine for each of them, help us manage our chronic conditions like diabetes, weight loss, et cetera. And then you also look at preventions. How do we do your uh, prenatals, your colonoscopies and all of that stuff to make sure that you're taking care of your preventions as well. That is one big area where all the data and AI is being used. Second is the financials. Uh, whether you're a payer or whether you're an insurance company, you need to see where your budgets are, how much money is coming in, where are you spending, how are you, how much days of accounts receivable you have, who owns you the money, how do you plan your follow-up strategies, where do you invest, which programs or which care, where do you want to invest, that's the second layer where uh, the data and AI is uh, uh, very helpful and being used right now. Third, healthcare quality programs. You every because you are all you know we are all governed by Medicare, Medicaid, um, um, CMS. We have guidelines for that. That every every treatment, every encounter from the patient uh, meets certain criteria and has benchmarks and standards. That's another area where you're able to leverage AI to bring trends and patterns and help them move close the gap. Population health, that's a big one uh, where we are looking at AI and data being used to look at the historical data to figure out which populations are more susceptible for certain conditions and what kind of intervention programs can we be brought in, women's health, what kind of access issues we have. You know, you might we might want to say that uh, a specific rural communities or areas which do not have a lot of infrastructure or not enough hospitals or access uh, we need to have additional kind of intervention for them. So how are you managing the population for that kind of community? So we are leveraging AI for that in terms of being able to predict and being able to project the requirements from there. Uh, the big, the big, as I mentioned, the, between the payer and the provider, the contracts, how they have, it's all at the end of the day, how much data, how much data are we using uh, and leveraging to build a contract, which is useful for both parties a lot of AI is being used there. So there's AI on the insurance side and the AI on the provider side. They're both entities are using this to build those contracts, which are beneficial at the end of the day for the patient. Um, workflow efficiency, healthcare operations and efficiency is in every industry which uh, AI is being used and uh, healthcare is no exception. There's a lot of um, help which is being provided by leveraging AI in the current scenario where we are talking about a lot of nursing shortages, administrative staff shortages and all of that kind of stuff. You're able to bring AI to be the human assistant, if you will, or a, a, a you know, bot friend as we're calling it, agents, what have you, to help them automate the workflows and increase the efficiency of the overall operations. Uh, telemedicine, remote monitoring, this is another area which has again come up during the last four or five years. We've already, always had telemedicine, but COVID accelerated the adoption of all of these technologies. Uh, patients are, it, it's expensive to have patients in the hospital set up in an inpatient environment to be under monitoring for a long period of time. So now we have alternate care settings where it could be in a nursing home, in a long-term care, in your own home, where the patient is then moved to that care setting, but you have enough equipment, enough uh, oversight to monitor the patient and all of this data and AI is leveraged. They will remind you to take your pills. It will remind you to take your temperature. It will, all the data gets transferred to, you know, some, some other group of people, nurses and uh, aides, and they, they will call you and tell you, hey, this is time for your diabetes medicine. All kinds of things are happening uh, for, for the telemedicine and remote monitoring area using AI. Predictive analytics is, of course, a given. This is like you're looking at your historical data, whether it's claims, whether it's uh, your, your uh, population health, what have you, to be able to take that historical data and predict trends and be smart enough for right intervention at the right time. Clinical research and trials is another area where data and AI is being used. And I'm going to pause there. And I know we're supposed to take a quick survey. Peter, I totally forgot about the survey part. And I'm going to pause and see if you want to do the survey and then we can continue. Sure, I'll post it right now. Okay. And we'll give users just 60 seconds for this. Okay.
Many of us are on the panel. I don't know if the panel can participate, so. And I'm closing the poll now. Peter, you're on mute. So we have an even distribution of undergraduates and graduate students. 75% um, uh, planning to work in the field uh, and, and half planning to work in data science specifically. Okay, so this, we, and then we'll continue, no need to change gears or change direction on the healthcare topic. I will continue um, with this topic. Is that fine for you, Peter? Yeah, okay. Um, so so why, why are we talking so much about data and AI at this point in time? I think there are multiple, multiple factors. As I said, AI and data, leveraging data has been around from the 60s. We had robotic surgeries from very long time. We, are, we have become, I mean, I wouldn't say we as in me, but uh, the industry has become very specialized and very, very nuanced in doing robotic, performing robotic surgeries. We've leveraged data over, for many years and we've had the resurgence of the informatics in the 80s. Uh, and the post, the, just before COVID is when we talked a lot about RPA, which is the robotic process automation. Uh, and that as, and the AI, which is again, the artificial intelligence, which is like a broad term used for machine learning, natural language processing, generative AI, uh, anything which you are looking to from a computer or a code to be able to um, leverage the data uh, is broad, broad bucketed as broad termed as AI. And the reason it is taking a center stage everywhere, and especially in healthcare is, Tremendous, tremendous staffing shortages because of uh, primarily driven by COVID. Uh, one, you had people who, um, you know, they, you worked remote and everybody was remote and a lot of people did not want to come back. Healthcare nursing takes a big hit. We, not, we don't have enough healthcare nurses coming out of the colleges as is required by the, uh, the industry at this point of time. A lot of physician shortages as well and administrative shortages, uh, staffing shortages as well. So that is one big driver and the labor and the cost is increasing tremendously. Your minimum wages have been increasing, your everything, every, every expense you've seen is increasing. So it's very difficult for a lot of providers to take care of their populations, to take, to continue to provide care because they cannot, you cannot turn down. If a patient is coming into your door, you need to take care of the patient and then figure out the claims and everything else. So they want to be able to take care of the patients who are walking in. So which means that they need to do everything under the sun to manage their costs. Uh, so that's one big uh, driver. Uh, second, there's, we've always had systems in healthcare which are very old. I would still see some green screens and I've still see some blue screens back in the day. I have, we've seen all of that, that still exists. Uh, there are some, some, healthcare is such a distributed industry. You have top hospitals and the rest are all the rest of the country. You have small physician groups, clinics, specialty care. I have seen um, um, physician, two, two single physician practices uh, in, in, in a small town or a county of thousand people. So they still operate. They're the only provider for that, uh, that region, so, but their systems and their data need to talk. They need to be able to send that information uh, to a large hospital if one of the patients is being sent for a surgery or an additional uh, procedure, the information has to talk. So the talking between systems has always been very difficult. These are because healthcare has been here for a long time. The systems are very old and it costs a lot of money from some of these smaller players to uh, move to upgrade to the new system. So you see everything under the sun and technology and that's a big driver. Data is water. I heard that somewhere two weeks ago. It's not my statement. Data is what it's everywhere. You need to be able to, you, you see everywhere, your data is everywhere. So then the amount, as I mentioned on the earlier slide, the standards of in healthcare are so many different standards. Each of the applications, each of the health systems uh, work and operate in their own way. So there's lots, large amount of complex data. You have not just uh, structured data, you have unstructured data, you have images, you have PDFs, you have everything, you know, it's visuals, your MRI, X-rays, 
there's a lot of all of that stuff so for us to be able to work with so that's another big reason why that's so important and and again to streamline the operations and improving processes uh, you will never find the same uh, implementation or same workflow uh, in two different hospital system or two different clinics if they have their own you know, system set up, how, how they're operating and everything else. So the AI, leveraging AI and data uh, helps to bring that kind of standardization, which overall brings the cost down and overall bring in, improves and give, gives the focus on the patient care. Um, and the, another very important is personalization. So now we are moving from saying that while I am a statistic in a group of 200, 300, whatever uh, a group of people, me as Pavani has their, her, her own requirements of her own genetic makeup, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the care has to be personalized to Pavani. So that's where we are moving right now, which is humanly not possible to have people doing this kind of analysis and giving out results or information and care and, and throughout, the, throughout the journey, uh, which is why we are using AI. And that's the reason, big reasons why the AI is taking center stage. Uh, uh, and so, so the technologies are all there. The technologies have already been there, finance sector, banking industry, retail. They've all been using versions without, without all these big, big uh, uh, sound bites around AI. They've all been using this for a long time. When you walk into an aisle uh, based in, in any, any department store, the way they pack, they, the way they put their merchandise is based on the data. It's based on how much all the data they had what is moving off the shelves, how much of that is inventory is moving off. So th this has been there. And when you go to a bank, what your transaction, your credit cards, what's your risk score, your credit scores, all of that is all driven by AI and data from a long time. And now that is coming into healthcare uh, to make an impact. And I'll talk a little bit of just as an you know, example of very, very, you know, uh, uh, hopefully everybody can relate to this. When you walk into, um, when we don't walk in, we, we get authorized and we sent to get a surgery or a procedure or something in a, in a hospital and we need a bed. The, the hospital people do not know, and anyone can refer, any of your physicians can send you to, let's say, St. Barnabas or uh, uh, Morriston Memorial or whichever the hospital, right? Your physicians come and sees you, you have a broken bone and you need to go, go to a certain place for a surgery and you walk in. And one day the hospital can have 100 people walk coming in. Another day they will have 20 people. You're, you're still, you're scheduled. And it's something, some could be emergency, some, you know, sometimes it's all of those kind of different things. So one of the, one of the hospitals uh, we were working with was struggling with how do you manage your... How many beds do we have? How do you manage our, you know, beds and accordingly have number of staff at the registration desk? Um, uh, how do you take the demographic information so we are not having the patients to wait in long queues while they're coming for some of those uh, treatments? And we deleverage. That's where one of the AI solutions we used is to look at historical data, seasonality, uh, you know, local demographic information, zip plus four data, all kinds of data is available for us to do this kind of predictive analysis. We were able to do that and, and help the hospital system to better predict to the accuracy of, I think, 20% margin to be able for them to staff their front office better, um, make sure their patients are not having more than 15 minutes of wait time, um, the giving them heads up information that the, the form comes to your phones. Everybody has smartphones these days. So the demographic, the patient intake forms is sent to you before you come in. So you're trying to eliminate the wait time at the office. There are multiple other uh, uh, events have been triggered before they come into the come into the location to help them navigate the process and leaving them to a better patient experience. I think one other thing I did not mention in in, in throughout the process is also that. Uh, insurance comes, so when, when we go to a physician, if you have an insurance, which most of us have, or when we, we have need to have, whether we go to the marketplace or through your employer, um, you go to the physician, physician takes a look at you, you have XYZ problem, and they send the bill to the insurance company. The insurance company then tells the, the hospital, you and I have a contract, remember, XYZ dated contract, so I'm going to pay you, you are charging me $100, but I'll pay you $50, and then they pay the $50 to the hospital, and the hospital in turn then comes back to, to me or the patient and says, hey, we charged $100, your contractual obligation, which the insurance took care, was $50, you need to pay the 
$50 back to me. So if you look at this, then me as a patient, I'm paying as much as an insurance company is paying, which is $50. So over the last 10 plus decade or so, the way the insurance contracts have been set up, the way the uh, employers are doing their contracts with the insurance companies, the way em employees are buying that thing, the patient or the, the, the individual member is becoming another important payer in the whole system. If not more, they are paying as much money as the, pro as the payer is paying to the, to the providers. So the patient is becoming a very important member in the whole thing. And now they're saying, if I can just go to my Google or iPhone or Android and have different options for different things in my life, I want this kind of experience in my healthcare. That's where the, the next generation of uh, people coming into the healthcare, asking for healthcare, they want that kind of a service. They want that kind of a flexibility. They want that kind of a options. So all of this, unless you have data backing up to provide those kind of alternatives, we wouldn't be able to serve that population. So that's again, a big driver for how we're looking at data and how patients and we have to look at the data that we are dealing with. Um, I could take a little few minutes to talk about in my experience, what are the different streams or areas of work, right? We all talk about data and AI. What does it translate to in, in real world, in, in jobs, in corporates, in work streams, if you will? Uh, uh, if, even, if you're, even if you're a physician or a nurse, they teach you math, I'm told, in their classes because they need to know to calculate how much what, how much drug you need to provide, you know, is it 500 mg, 200 mg based on the weight, etc. So even if you're a clinician, you need to know math. So which means you're generating data, which is going to be meaningful for someone else. Uh, so the first level, of course, is the data analyst. When you're getting, looking at all of this data, how are you organizing this? How are you standardizing this? How are you able to, you know, look at the data and put them in separate buckets, what you will all of that is the for one stream of data. And again, the lot of traditional tools, lot of AI tools out there, but we need to understand the context of the data for us to be able to do that. The second stream is, is the data science, this, you know, developing the models, looking at different kinds of um, dependencies, theories, hypotheses, and developing the models that second stream data science. Uh, informatics specialists, again, in the context of healthcare, I'm talking about this in the context of healthcare, informatics specialists, these are the ones who, this is stream, this is a big, huge stream of um, options, of opportunities out there, who are looking not only at the data, but also at the systems on how the systems are exchanging this kind of data, what fields are going into which system, how do you make the system more effective, how do you make, how do you take the whole data exchange process more effective, that's the big, big stream. These guys also help when companies want to transition from one application to another application, you have to move your databases, you have to move everything else, these guys help with all of that also. Uh, clinical data manager, so if you're talking about specific, all the clinical data, right, you have patient physician notes, you have their um, vital signs, you have a lot of information and that, that data manager is very, very important, not only for patient care and looking at how do we organize all of that, but also relevant because when you have an insurance company pushing back and saying, hey, but why did you do knee surgery for him? He, he had a problem with the hip. Then the clinical data manager is who will look at all of that information and say, and go back to the history and prove a case on why the knee surgery was required. So they need to look at the data from a clinical aspect so they understand separate certifications are available. All of that is available for the clinical data manager. Uh, business analysts or business and BI specialists, you know, this, this is being able to understand the process, the workflows, uh, look at look at all of the, you know, the whole lay of the land to be able to uh, run with that. That's another layer of uh, uh, work opportunities you would have uh, in, in, in the healthcare space. Um, again, big driver, for big, big um, topic for discussion uh, these days on this is now that we have enough, enough momentum to talk about this, this cybersecurity and data compliance is a big stream. Uh, that's against a lot of courses that are out there and a lot of requirement and need for um, bringing those kind of standards into your day to day operation. This is not, let me see when a problem happens. This is preempting and putting those in, in, in place, steps in place so that 
we are avoiding all of that uh, going in. And again, you have large players, you have Googles and Microsoft of the world uh, coming, were operating in this space. So they have a lot of uh, suite of solutions and offerings within Azure, within AWS, within all of those things. And there are also a lot of open source technologies out there. So there is a lot of opportunity there for people to, and not everybody can afford AWS or Azure or Microsoft. So there's a lot of opportunity for people to look at this, um, this stream of work and this layer of activity. Um, and, and AI programmers, developers, and governance, this is a whole new, uh, you need, you definitely need, you know, coding, whether it's uh, Python or all of that language, for AI coding, there are specific tools out there and you can learn it's a Java based tools or you know Jade frameworks and all of that kind of stuff. So you're able to do actual AI, you're able to do the programming. And you also have these days, a lot of technologies which are low code to zero code. So you don't necessarily need to know the code, how to code, but you're, you get trained on using the user interface to create those um, models and workflows and uh, create those uh, AI models for us to do what you're required to do. So you need to be able to look at the um, UI based technologies for all of this and not necessarily you know coding but coding knowledge is always good and it's not complicated if i can like do that everybody anybody can do that it's it's you know like a few few weeks or a couple of months of uh, uh, training and lessons what we have um, all sounds great and good uh, but again ai isn't perfect this is not here to solve world hunger or you know create world peace ai comes with its own challenges and considerations I think there's a big talk about this going on. We've, we've seen enough um, drama in the AI world. Um, the, as we're all talking, even if a person, a, a new member comes into your team and you want the person to do some task, you will pair them with someone who's more experienced. The experienced person will teach them how to do, or you go back and look at your history. So you you AI is learning from what humans have already done and the data we already have in the systems. And if all of that is not evenly distributed, there's an inherent data bias. It's a very important concept and we don't have an answer for solution for this. Uh, everybody's talking about this, that how, so one of the, one of the things we do uh, in, in whichever case we do is uh, regular evaluation of the results coming out of these AI models. You, we cannot think of, I have developed an AI model and the AI model will run on its own forever, doesn't, does not work and it should not be the case because there's a lot of bias uh, coming in and con continuously helping these AI models to learn. There are a lot of models there which are self-learning, auto-learning, um, um, some words which I'm forgetting right now, but uh, you don't need to help the models to learn. Uh, they will, they're looking at the data and they're learning on their own. So it's very important for us to be mindful of the bias coming in. We don't have enough data and specifically in the healthcare uh, um, database, uh, the data for minority communities, African-American communities is all very skewed. You don't have enough data coming in to for us to do that. So that's a very, very important point, specifically in the healthcare. Uh, the second one is the black box challenge. I think you hear now things like the glass box, moving from black box to glass box. The, the, the point of AI models is you want high accuracy or you want transparency. We are, we are at that stage of the technology development where we, if you want AI to tell you exactly what it is doing, how, which models, which variables, what it is doing, it has an impact on the accuracy of the model. If you don't care for the transparency, you care for the accuracy, uh, that's where we are right now. Uh, just the way the models are, just the way they're operating, just the way it is. And there's a big, there's a big push to talk to make this black box a glass box. And we learned, you know, in, in my, in our own company, we learned it in the hard way where we were looking at uh, unstructured documents coming in, which the AI was reading to tell whether it's a it's a patient letter, it's an insurance document, it's an attorney letter, and it was predicting what kind of a letter was it and which queue it needs to go to. Uh, and there were some 10% of errors coming in. And when you kind of go in and look at those errors, there is no reason or right. And I mean, there's, there's no way the AI program could have told you that why certain documents are in a different queue, even though it had that criteria in there. So when you go in and um, make these criteria much more nuanced and much more narrower, 
it has an impact from the 10% to the error rate increase to 16%. But your app, but whatever was there, the rest of the 84% were much more accurate. So there is a there is a bal there is a, a give and take and the nuances there. And, and all of that is very important for us to consider when you're looking at what kind of AI models and the black box experience. Uh, protecting patient privacy, as we talked about this earlier too, that that's a very important thing. And the, 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 for AI, the learning curve is a, is a big deal for both AI and humans. Um, AI learns with your historical data. The more the data you provide, the more smarter, the more intelligent it becomes. In the same way, staff or members or people who are using AI, they also, there's a change management process. You know, I've been doing coding for forever. And now you tell me to use an AI or gen AI to like not do the coding, but just check the coding. So there's a change management request and there's a learning curve on both sides. And the upside of the whole of this is that then I can spend more time on, you know, thinking about the next problem, think conceptualizing my next situation versus just doing the coding for a problem statement for today, I can solve the problems for tomorrow. So that, that's where it is. And human uh, oversight is definitely required for some of these AI models instead of just uh, continuing to let them run in an autopilot mode. It's important for us to look at, um, have a human oversight periodically to check, put those checks and balances in place. Uh, and then again, and they, if there's a big, uh, thing around everywhere that AI is going to replace, AI is going to take away our jobs. We said the same thing when the internet came, we said the same thing when the phones came, we said the same thing, you know, when we had a lot of other changes. Um, AI will augment what we are doing and humans and, you know, all of us will learn to do more nuanced tasks, which are more personable, which are more humanly what we're supposed to be doing uh, and also be able to um, move the needle to perform and produce better and more than just moving data between screens. That's that's the goal of uh, how we should be looking at using AI in your day-to-day -day lives. And then, and again, again, another very, very important thing is how is this AI information, knowledge, expertise available across board, across you know all of the populations? How are we democratic, democratizing things? Are we only available in you know, you know, in, in Ivy League colleges or some you know, top tier one colleges, or are we able to provide this uh, across all colleges in the, in the community? And how are the 